So this idea that you can just take the FSD, vision AI, all this learning, the neural nets, mm-hmm. the computer, the systems, put it over to the bot. Do you think some people are saying that they are estimating that Tesla might might must have over a thousand bots at some point? Not maybe not this year, but next year, because you need that many to be able to start teaching it with, you know, like right now we have a million cars out there with all the cameras to 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 learn. They need to have that many out there. Do you think that uh, that that's the case, or is it some other way that they're going to be when they well, transport it over? Is it is it working right out of the box? Is it going to be a complete rewrite? What what are we expecting here? The the bot problem, F the our you know sort of externally watching what happened with FSD is not necessarily going to give you the best understanding of what the trajectory will be for bots. Um, cars have cars have a space of problems that bots just don't have. Um, and the, the need to be absolutely safe uh, right. when you're driving a car is, is a really high hurdle. And the, the unfortunate reality of the world we drive in is that human beings drive with negative safety margin all the time. And so you kind of, we just do. We drive all the time. You know, it's like, I want to say three quarters of the cars I see on the freeway are driving close enough to the car ahead of them that if the guy in front panic stopped, they would definitely yeah. rear-end him. Right. That's negative margin because you're not prepared for the possibility. They know from years and years of driving that that almost never happens. And they're in a hurry. <laughs> right. <laughs> so they're just going to tell, and, you know, because we're emotional animals and we do stupid things all the time. Uh, the same thing we see people, you know, you, you'll see a couple of cars like doing a left doing a left turn at a light that's timed in a city or something like that. And you'll see people, they'll be two feet apart, you know, doing the left turn through the intersection. And if anybody in that chain had to stop, it'd just be punk, 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 they'd all hit, right? So why don't they wait, you know, a half car length or something to do that? Because they're in a hurry, right? And the light might change. We do that. So we unfortunately, this is the thing that Waymo discovered. Waymo, uh, a long time ago, they had a car which... Like if they just set the car to drive as safe as it could, it could navigate in the real world. And it just pissed off people, right? Because because we want it to go faster, the thing. So the number one accident they had back then, and still the number one accident they have is they get rear-ended, right? Mm -hmm. Because people follow them too close because they're trying to get the car to go faster. And then it stops for something they wouldn't have stopped for. And boop, you know, you got a little fender bender Mm -hmm. on your hands. Um, Mm -hmm. So... To be successful at this task, it's not sufficient to just like understand the world pretty well and drive such that you don't hit something. You have to learn to drive in a world full of totally irrational people and deal with that somehow in a way that like you're you're getting to your destination and you're not having any accidents and you're not pissing people off. And that just turns out to be a much harder problem than just getting where you're going safely. Uh, so, you know, that was what Waymo learned, you know, many years ago. That's what Cruz learned also. You know, Cruz has had a whole bunch of problems where, uh, you know, drivers in San Francisco get pissed off at them and it has these negative consequences, but they're just trying to be safe and humans don't see it that way. They want to get where they're going like right now. Um, And FSD is in that same world. FSD, it has to deal with the reality that people are irrational, um, that other drivers are not going to cut you any slack you know, and, and you just have to deal with that. You know, the, the passengers in your car, a, a sure way to make your exit is to just get in the right most lane three miles ahead of time. Right. And you take five or 10 minutes to get there. And the thing is people in the cars, it drives them crazy. If they see yeah. the lane next to them is going faster. Like that's a total fail from a safety mm-hmm. point and an ease of use and everything. What, what's wrong with that? Like it's literally going to take you 15 seconds longer to get where you're going. If you just get in a lane early and you don't have the stress of trying to merge later, but They can't do that. They have to stay in the lane, in the fast moving lane right to the minute. And then they have to try to squeeze in because that's what humans do. And that's what humans expect. It just makes a problem a lot harder. So that problem could continue being hard. You know, it can continue being hard for quite a while. And, you know, the we're Tesla's also learning. Waymo's also learning you know, what people will put up with, what the other drivers will put up with, what the passengers will tolerate. And that has been different than people thought it was going to be. So this this problem is is, is taking longer. And I'm sorry, and I forgot what the original question was. <laughs> the bot, the transfer to the bot. Yeah. Oh yeah. So bot has a different space of requirements that are completely different. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't have this crazy safety thing. The bot can just move slower, especially early bots. 
you know, when you're developing this stuff. If the bot's not safe, it can stop it. There's there's nobody walking behind the bot in the in the corridor who's going to get upset if the bot walk, walks slowly. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll have a task and you'll want it to get done in, in, in a certain frame amount of time. But when you're initially using the bot, if the bot takes more time, well, the bot's just wasting its own time as long as it doesn't need supervision. So mm -hmm. the place that the bot is harder than the car is the world the bot occupies is much more complicated than the world the car mm -hmm. occupies. Like the the rich, well, first of all, it's a fully 3D world, um, you know, because the bots bend, can bend over, it can lift things, it can get stuff off of high shelves, you know, there's everything about uh -huh. it is. The, in the cars, it's kind of this pseudo 2D thing. For the most part yeah. on a car, you don't care about height. I mean, occasionally you encounter like a truck or something hanging over and you got to worry about how tall it is. But for the most part, you know, you're on a 2D grid and most of what you want to know about the world is 2D. So Tesla can do like the bird's eye view looking down on the car from the top and have a almost, it's not perfect, but it's very close to perfect understanding of the situation just looking down from above because the height of things very rarely matters. The bot, you can't do that, right? The bot will mm. be going under things all the time or, you know, it has to deal with stuff at different heights. And so it has to perceive this, you know, the, the, so that's, so that's the thing. It's got it has to deal with a much finer resolution. Like to a first approximation, a car can break the world up into like, you know, shoebox size blocks mm -hmm. and just basically say, well, is there something in that block or is it empty? And if it's empty, I can drive through it, right? If the, if any, um, the, the bot, in order to understand and interact with objects, it might need like, you know, a cubic millimeter or smaller than a cubic millimeter is the basic resolution that it pursues the world with. And because that vo volumetric size is so small, and then the biggest distance the bot might need to be, the bot might need to look across a warehouse 400 yards away to identify the target that it wants to go to. So it's got a, you know, you can't mapping out 400 yards in one millimeter cubes is that's just a lot of resolution. And the car doesn't have to do that either. The car has to do it faster. The bot can mm -hmm. be slow, but the bot needs higher resolution. It's got a more complicated planning thing. Like planning where you're going to walk in house is a lot more complicated than, than planning where you're going to drive on a road, given the space of, of things you might have to interact with. Not, not the least of which is, you know, difficult to predict human beings in your environment. So um, in certain respects, the bot is easy, much, much easier than the car. And in other respects, it's tough, but it's, mm -hmm. but I would say the bot is easy to get started on. Like if you had mm -hmm. 10 bots, you can start collecting useful amounts of data right away. If you have a hundred bots, that's also more bots is better. More bots, more data, more tasks, yeah. more of that stuff that you bring in, the faster you're going to gather stuff. And almost as important, we, we talk a lot about having a big fleet as being a good way to gather data, but. Mm -hmm. But the big fleet also allows you to test your a complicated system really, really fast. Like these systems have incredibly complicated behaviors and you want to get them out in the world and let them interact in all these amazingly complicated ways and explore that whole space of all the possible things that could happen as quickly as possible. And the more cards you have, the faster you can evaluate any change that you do. And it'll be the same thing with bots. So more bots is definitely better. But, you know, if Tesla's, I, I suspect... Uh, and I, other people have said this too, that the, the obvious place for Tesla to start using bots when they get them is put them in a factory. So in mm -hmm. a factory environment, you can make it as complicated or as simple as you want to. Like industrial robots right now, we they, they go in a cage and they have an incredibly simple environment. Like, you know, they can do anything that they want inside the space that they can reach. The only thing they need to know about is some part which is going to be precisely placed exactly where they mm -hmm. need it. And some other part they're going to put it on, which is also going to be put like right to the millimeter exactly where they need it. They, they need so little adaptability. So that's one extreme. The other extreme is, you know, an intern in a crowded closet with boxes and garbage and all that kind of stuff, trying to find the thing that the postman delivered yesterday, right? Where he's, you're digging through all of this stuff and it's clutter and the illumination might not be good. And you might be picking up flexible things, inflatable things, heavy things, light things, right? That's a really complicated environment. Putting a bot in that job like that, it'll, it'll take longer to do that because the environment is much richer and less constrained and whatnot. But Tesla could decide you know, to give a very highly constrained environment initially to the robots to get them working. And then as you, you know, you never, you don't want to make it easy because these are you know, just like you don't want to make, you, you don't want FSD to be easy for people to drive. You learn more if it's hard. 
So you want the mistakes to happen because you're going to learn from those mistakes. Those failures that we all experience driving FSD, those are valuable yeah. to the company in making the product better. And similarly, you don't want to, you're not going to be wanting to use development versions of Optimus in an environment which is so sterile it can never fail. You want it to be hard enough that it bumps up against its limitations more or less constantly. And that's another thing that you can do more safely with more robots. So that's all good. But you know, they could probably use Optimus for useful things in the factory today if they really wanted to, if it was worth yeah. the effort to get them out there, get them programmed and have people do the care and feeding and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's the obvious place to put the robot in the first, you know, six months, one year, maybe two years that you do that. And then when you move outside that, you get Frito-Lay or, you know, you get, yeah. you get you know, somebody at Amazon, you, you kind of deal with some, uh, some other big companies that have factories or warehouses or these fairly regimented initial jobs to do that. And what you work your way toward is being able to unload the dishwasher, being able to go in somebody's house, being able to deliver a package in any environment, up and down the stairs, in a high rise building, uh, you climb a ladder, nail solar shingles on the roof. You know, there's, there's this whole <laughs> extremely rich range of things yeah. that we could ask these robots to do. And they will eventually be able to do these things. Like that, that the horizon on that is, is, is approaching quickly now. I mean, this is not a 50 year away kind of thing. We're going to see very general purpose robots, but they're going to start with easier jobs and they're going to do more difficult jobs. It, it, things are easy and hard from the robot's perspective, right? To me, cl for me, cleaning a toilet isn't very complicated. For a robot, it's really hard. It's going to be crazy, yeah. yeah. So you're pretty confident, eh? Or do you think yeah. that they can move faster than most people think? Um, now that you, last time we talked and uh, you were speculating at that point what the bot could be like, now we actually see it. And mm. uh, do you think that this is easy to build for Tesla? Not not for everybody, but for Tesla's manufacturing ability. Will they have a thousand? Will it be coming out sooner than we think? And will it have the intelligence and ability to move sooner than we think? Or is it going to be another one of those FSD thing? Like, we really don't know. It could be, you know, long waits before we see improvements. Um, where's your, yeah, optimism on this? I think that the envelope, as I, like, you could start making Optimus useful pretty quickly if you wanted really simple, like moving cardboard boxes around a factory. Like, you could, mm -hmm. you could, and if you constrain the problem in the environment, you could probably get functionality out of it. Is it a good use of Optimus at that point? I think the last time, I can't remember if it was in our conversation or not, but I had said that, you know, almost anything you can build a specialized robot for, a specialized robot always beats a general purpose robot. The, the way a general purpose robot builds uh, wins is that it's general. Like you can, you can build zillions of copies of one robot and it can do thousands of different jobs. So mm -hmm. it's useful in that, in that, you know, it's like the difference between having a car and having a trolley that goes from your house to your work. You know, it's good to be mm -hmm. able to also go to the grocery store, also go on a road trip, you know, also pick up your kids at school. Uh, but purpose built robots that just do one thing, they win. And so like in a, in a factory for moving cardboard boxes, there are purpose built robots that do that. And Optimus wouldn't be better than that. There, there probably aren't jobs in the short run that Optimus is clearly going to be a win on that you don't already have some other, you know, robot for. So it'll take a little while for that stuff to change for using Optimus in the factory to be a clear win for the factory. But using Optimus in the factory could be a clear win for training Optimus. It, that could be true today. And so they might be using them in the factory today. Like, I wouldn't be surprised to okay. hear that they yeah. were. I suspect they, like, if you asked me, like, I'd say it's probably less than 50% probability, but it depends on what they're trying to do. So they've got two fairly different tasks that they're doing simultaneously. One, they're trying to make the, 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 the robot a good body. And the other thing they're trying to do is make it smart. And these are kind of connected to one another. Making the robot smart depends on having robots that you can develop the software on and having a fleet of them that you can use for gathering data. So you want to do all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, you know, I think the goal is to build a $10,000 bot. And, yeah. they're, you know, the thing they're making right now is not $10,000. It has the potential to get there. But they are, you know, there are a lot of things that they have to figure out about what's the best way to build a bot and then what's the best way to build the parts to build that bot, right? So, for instance, the motors, I, a long time ago, I identified the actuators. Those are totally critical. There aren't good actuators 
in the real world pre-existing that, that are well yeah. suited to a humanoid robot. On the other hand, they can totally be made and Tesla can totally make those actuators, but it's not a one and done kind of thing where you just design it on paper. You can design it, build it, you can get it in the body, you can run and run, you can have the software guys play with it. You can find problems with it and then you're going to iterate and make it better. And on your 25th or 50th or 100th motor, you're going to have a really good motor that's inexpensive to make. It's very efficient. It's extremely reliable. And that's the one where you're going to like, you're going to go put, put that in mass production. And yeah, they're going to make 100,000 of these things. I mean, they, it, uh, they might have 1,000 now. They could. They're pr uh, probably not. They're probably not at the development state. They're probably not mature enough that, that they've got a design that's worth making 1,000 of because it's right. probably improving so fast. You want to get to a point where you're not, you know, you don't want to change all your thousand robots the day after you make them right, because right, you found right. something great. You want the design to kind of stabilize. And my guess would be that that would take a little while. On the other hand, if they had a great application for it right now and they really wanted to gather a lot of data, they could go crank out a thousand of them. The, the, you know, the, the actuators I've seen, the body design elements that I've seen, they're, you know, it's, it's a combination of easy to fabricate and off the shelf stuff. For the most part, almost mm -hmm. everything is. So mm -hmm. if they wanted to build a thousand, they could totally do it. Is it worth it? It might be. It depends on what their short-term objectives are. Mm -hmm.